Okay, I think we can start. Um, welcome to all attendees. I see we've got quite a few from the USA, um, Canada, South Africa, and Tanya from Australia. Welcome. I am Lynette Rudman, and I will be your host tonight. And I'm coming to you live from Grahamstown in South Africa. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel in a few days time. If you have any questions um, to ask Tanya, our guest speaker, then please just include them in the chat box below and we'll have a Q&A session after her presentation. It's good to have um, Tanya here um, as our guest speaker. It is Women's Month being March, and it's good to celebrate excellent um, women birders in this month. Um, Tanya Ayrton, as I said, is from Australia. It's a very ancient land with one of the oldest First Nation cultures in the world. It is a land with unique animals and birds. And Australia has a diverse range of habitats from the, um, from the tropical rainforests in Queensland to the dry, arid deserts of the outback and the warm tropical waters in the north to the frigid, icy cold waters of the Southern Ocean in the south. Um, I was lucky in 2003 to visit Australia and I, I birded a bit in Sydney up to Queensland, Fraser Island and Lady Musgrave Island. So I'm really looking forward to uh, Tanya's talk tonight. Tanya has a passion for birds. Um, for over half a century, she has been a birder. She's birded all over Australia and its territories and also in New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Sumatra, Hong Kong, South Korea, and New Caledonia as well. She has been president of the BirdLife Bayside since it started in 1996. And she has led many outings and given many talks to conservation and natural history groups. She has a graduate certificate in ornithology from the Charles Sturt University. And she's also a member of the Victorian Ornithological Records Appraisal Committee, which assess and adjudicate on submission claims of, of rare birds in Victoria, in Australia. Tanya will be giving an introduction to birds and birding in Australia and its territories. We, lo we look forward to hearing all about your Aussie birds, um, Tanya. And thank you for waking up extremely early. I think it's five o'clock there in Oz um, to give this presentation. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you. I'll just share the screen. This is only an introduction to Australia's birds because there's an awful lot to cover. So this is just giving you a flavor. Now, for anyone who's unaware, Australia, this is Australia's place in the world. You can see it's bounded by the Indian Ocean on the west, the Pacific Ocean on the east, the Southern Ocean, and New Guinea and Indonesia in the north. It's the smallest continent and the largest island. Now, in size, it's nearly 4,000 kilometres or 2,500 miles from west to east, and nearly 3,700 kilometres or 2,300 miles from north to south, from the top of Cape York in Queensland to Southern Tasmania. It's approximately the size of the USA if you exclude Alaska and Hawaii. There are six states and two internal territories, which all have their own governments. And there's a single federal government with the federal parliament based in the Australian Capital Territory, which you can see inside New South Wales there. There are similar laws across the country, but watch out for food exclusions if you're traveling here, because fruit and vegetables and honey is banned from entering Western Australia from the east. And going into South Australia from the west, you can't take fruit and vegetables in there either. 
And the currency is the Australian dollar, which is currently worth about 67 cents US or about uh, just over 12 South African Rand. Now, one of the reasons Australia's birds are so different is due to the uh, movement of the plates many, many millions of years ago. Uh, the original continent of Gondwana in the south started to split apart about 180 million years ago. And Australia and New Guinea on a single plate separated about from Antarctica about 50 million years ago, drifting north and started to impact the Asian plate about 15 million years ago. And from about 120,000 years ago, we entered a period of uh, periodic ice ages, which lowered sea level and narrowed the gap between Asia and Australia, allowing the movement of species uh, between the two sides. One of the other important areas to know is the Wallace Line, which is a faunal boundary named by the biologist Thomas Henry Huxley after the British naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, who drew the line in 1859. It's marked by a deep water channel between Bali and Lombok that kept the two regions separated even at the lowest sea levels. Now, uh, on the diagram, you can see on the west, you've got all the Asian type uh, animals and includes, that includes birds like woodpeckers and bulbuls, which aren't found at all. Um, on the eastern side of the line, except for a um, red whiskered bulbul, which was introduced to Australia, and there's a few of those left. And on the east of the line are things like tree kangaroos, cockatoos, um, honey eaters, and birds of paradise. Now, one of the um, things you've got to watch out for are the confusing names. Um, you can blame the early ornithologists for this. Um, the, the original assumption was that all bird species originated in Europe and spread to the rest of the world, so they used the same names for similar looking birds. So we have wrens because we have a, um, a whole lot of things that cock their tails. We've got fairy wrens, scrub wrens, grass wrens, emu wrens, heath wrens and field wrens. The babblers, chuff, chats, magpie and a lot of other birds are not actually related to anything overseas they're all most closely related to one another. They're the Australopapuan group of birds that is only found here uh, in um, New Guinea and um, into Eastern Indonesia and into some of the Pacific Islands. We've even got, uh, if you come across flycatchers, they're not related to anything overseas unless they're one of the vagrants. Um, and we've got as I said, robins, scrub robins. And recently, some of our robins have become fly robins because they were known as fly catchers, but they're more closely related to robins, except they're the uh, Australian robins. And then they use the similarity of, of flight and um, hooked beaks to have cuckoo shrikes, shrike tits, and you've got quail thrushes and shrike thrushes. So it's all very confusing. The interesting thing is that recent findings have found that waterfowl, parrots and passerines or songbirds originated in Australia after it separated from Gondwana, which is um, a, a poke in the eye to the early ornithologists. Now the vegetation regions, um, this was a useful map because you can see where the deserts are in bright orange, uh, surrounded by grassland and woodland. Um, and then the darker areas are the rainforest, uh, mostly up in um, Queensland and uh, halfway down the eastern coast. Some forests and a little bit of alpine vegetation on the Victoria and New South Wales border and into Tasmania. Now the deserts include both sandy deserts and stony deserts. The other thing to be aware of is forest and woodland areas may be extensively cleared for farmland. So in some areas, we may have 95% of vegetation cover removed for farmland and grazing. There's 89 bioregions uh, covering Australia. Um, and the colors here are used to amalgamate uh, those 89 regions into these phytogeographic regions based on plant species turnover. Um, 
the bright pink area is, is the Southwest Australian floristic region. And it's the only global biodiversity hotspot for species richness and endemism in Australia. Uh, talking about plants, it's got 7,000 plant species of which 52% are endemic to the area. Now that roughly corresponds to uh, these approximate endemic bird areas. So we've got Cape York and the wet tropics in Queensland, the Eastern Seaboard, Southeastern Australia and Tasmania, the Central Channel Country, the Southern and Central Deserts, Northwestern Australia, which is um, mostly monsoonal, and then that area in Southwestern Australia. Now there's over 950 species recorded in Australia and its territories, which includes vagrants and, may, and a few um, things like a single Magellanic penguin that was beach washed here. But we've only got time for a, a bit of a flavour. So we'll have a look, a closer look at Cape York, which is in the top right, and the central channel country in the middle right. Now this is Iron Range on Cape York Peninsula. It has um, tropical rainforest and some open tropical savanna. And this is the, um, the road that goes through to Portland Roads. Now, a number of the birds I'll show could be found in other places, but this is just a, a basically a point in time. Here's the sulfur crested cockatoo. It's quite a ubiquitous cockatoo. Uh, it's found over um, a lot of um, Eastern Australia and, and um, further, further west. Uh, with, in, in fact, in Sydney, it started, I, I don't know whether you have wheelie bins in other places, large bins that we put out for, uh, for our rubbish to be collected. Uh, but these birds in Sydney have actually learned how to open those very big bins, even if people weigh down the, uh, the lids and they pull out all the rubbish looking for, looking for anything they can get their beaks into. And this is one of the birds that didn't make it across Wallace's line. Um, a few birds have, but many haven't. Another type of parrot that we get up there is the pale-headed rosella. There's a number of rosellas around Australia and this is one representative. And then we go to the tiny little birds. This is a double-eyed fig parrot, which is only a few inches long. Um, builds a, uh, has a, a oh, this is in its nest hollow. It's a female bird. Uh, and they're, if you're, when they get into a, a leafy tree, they're almost impossible to distinguish because they're about the same size as a leaf. And it's the smallest Australian parrot, only 40 grams. This is the Papuan eclectus. It's been recently uh, split. It was known as the eclectus parrot, but it's been split into about seven species, according to the latest IOC taxonomy. Uh, the female is in the nest hollow on the left, and she is interestingly bright red and blue uh, because she spends her time in the nest hollow, and she'll be accompanied by up to three males that feed her um, several times a day and they're predominantly green because they sit on guard outside the nest. So it's one of those cases where the female is more brightly colored than the male. One of the spectacular birds up at Cape York, only found in Cape York and New Guinea is the palm cockatoo. And it's a very interesting cockatoo in that it actually uh, uses a tool to make sound. It will find itself a small stick and it will beat the stick against um, a hollow tree uh, and give periodic shrieks. It's quite a spectacular bird when it's flying. Um, by the way, all the pictures, um, if the picture doesn't have any uh, accreditation to another photographer, then they were taken by me. Now this is one of our uh, robins, it's found here. This is the white faced robin. So we have a number of robins and they can be fairly small to um, much bigger birds. This is, this is only found uh, up on Cape York. And then we have the Northern scrub robin. 
which is a, a much bigger bird. Uh, there's two scrub robins in Australia. Uh, they're mostly found on the ground. This one is in a, um, a vine thicket up on, in Iron Range. And then here's one of our fly robins. So it was known as a fly catcher, but it's more closely related to the Australian robins. This is the lemon bellied fly robin. We actually have two species of fly robin and another bird that's very closely related, um, but because it's called Jackie Winter, we didn't need to change the name on that one. And these small birds are often found high in the canopy and they can be very difficult to spot. The yellow-breasted boatbill. Um, this is this is uh, this is. I think this is a good angle because you can actually see why it's called a boatbill. You've got this um, wide uh, beak with a strong keel. You can just see the point of the keel coming up. And this is another type of Australian flycatcher, very brightly coloured, but uh, also quite small. So it's uh, when they're moving, they can be difficult to follow in the canopy. We have a number of whistlers in Australia. Um, this is the Rufus whistler. So the uh, we've also got a golden whistler, which has the similar colouring, uh, darker on the back and bright yellow underneath. Um, and that's been recently split into the Australian golden whistler and the Western whistler, which is started off just being in WA, but as they're doing taxonomic work, uh, it's now spread all the way to uh, the Victorian um, Western Victoria. And this is one of the um, main uh, groups of birds in the in the Australian uh, passerines. There's quite a few of, of the whistlers also in New Guinea. Uh, this is one of the smaller cuckoo shrikes. We have a couple of species of trilla, which are the very small cuckoo shrikes. And this is a varied trilla. Um, it's mostly found in northern Australia across uh, Queensland and the top end. And they're called trillers because they have a trilling call, uh, which is a bit different to the, the cuckoo shrike trills. We also have four species of bird of paradise in Australia. There are three rifle birds. Um, this is the one found up in far north Queensland. So the magnificent rifle bird is found in Cape York. Uh, we also have Victoria's rifle bird and Paradise rifle bird, which are found all the way down to um, the southeast Queensland is the lowest they, they come in, and they're separated geographically, the three species. And the other bird of Paradise we have is the trumpet manucode, which is also found in Papua New Guinea, as is the magnificent rifle bird. Um, they're very unusual birds. Now, some of our monarch flycatchers. This is the white-eared monarch. So these are in essentially, um, uh, there's a group of black and white uh, flycatchers called the monarchs that are found in uh, the Queensland rainforests. Um, and they have a, a relative, the magpie lark. So if anyone's seen a magpie lark, it's recently been found to be an aberrant monarch flycatcher. And this is the white-eared monarch. Um, so cool because you can see the, the ear coverts are completely white. And that's contrasting with the frill necked monarch, which is uh, has this beautiful white frill on the back of its neck uh, and a blue eye ring. This is the male. Um, they're been split from the um, frilled monarch in New Guinea um, and we're I'm one of the people who regularly goes to the Torres Strait Islands, hoping that we'll get a frilled monarch turn up on the Northern Islands so that we can count it on the Australian list. And a closely related monarch, we've got a, a number of other monarchs which have this beautiful rufous underneath. And this is the representative that's only found up in Iron Range, the black wing monarch. Now, one of the interesting things about Cape York is because it's so close to Papua New Guinea, we get a number of species that migrate from Papua New Guinea 
down onto Cape York for the breeding season. Uh, and one of those is the yellow bill kingfisher. Uh, it's quite a small kingfisher, um, always high up in the forest. Um, and it's got a, an, a very interesting trill, which is reminiscent of some of the cuckoos that we get up there, like the um, chestnut belly cuckoo. And it's, um, <clears throat> it's one of the, the species that a lot of people go to see in uh, Cape York. Uh, they're normally there from about October through to uh, February, uh, which happens to coincide with when the monsoon is. So when you go up there for that time of year, you're likely to get rain every day and it's going to be hot and 100% humidity most of the time. We also have um, buff-breasted paradise kingfisher, which is an absolutely gorgeous bird. I couldn't find a photo that showed the long white tail um, that uh, it has, but they're very, uh, they nest in termite mounds on Cape York, um, but only uh, where there's dense forest as well. But that's another of the migratory um, birds from Papua New Guinea. Now this is one of the um, resident flycatchers. Um, there's, so this is another group. Um, this is the broad-billed flycatcher. It's only found up in um, uh, Northern Australia. And then we have the black butcher bird, um, which is, <coughs> it's recently been found that Australia's magpie uh, which is basically called a magpie because it's black and white, is a, a type of butcher bird. So it's got a very similar beak with the, the, the sort of the bluey grey um, base to the bill and the black tip. And this one um, has been found to be the basal um, bird of the whole group in Australia. They're quite a large um, butcher bird and they're only found across Northern Australia. And the um, juveniles are bright rufous all over. So very different to tell, uh, very, if you're not familiar with that, it's, you end up looking at a completely different bird. And here's another bird that migrates to um, Cape York from Papua New Guinea. This is the Papuan pitta, used to be called the red-bellied pitta. Um, often difficult to see because they will they stay in the, the darkest parts of the forest, uh, but we were very lucky with the light uh, this particular day. Um, and the bird ended up going around us several times. So we, we got some good shots as we just had to swivel in place. We've got um, three different pitters in Australia. Uh, there's a rainbow pitter in, um, Northern Territory and the uh, Papuan pitter in Cape York. And we have a noisy pitter as well, which is from Cape York down into, um, can be as far as Northern New South Wales. And we have three frogmouth species. Uh, this is the Papuan frogmouth. It has an absolutely massive bill. That's basically the width of the head, as you can see here and here, it's on a nest um, up in Cape York. Uh, they do extend down um, into Cairns and a bit further south. So it's possible to see them without going all the way up to Cape York. And one of the, the startling things that we found up at Iron Range, this was in, we had a trip in January. This is a young southern cassowary. Um, the, the gentleman who was guiding us there has been spent 30 years up in Iron Range guiding. That's the first time he's ever seen a cassowary at Iron Range. They're in some of the hills um, further to the west. Uh, but this is a young bird. It's probably only about two years old. Um, and it was having a wander through the territory. So it was the first time he'd seen one in, in Iron Range in his life. So that gives you a flavour for the for the. Uh, Iron Range. And now the, the central channel country, um, this picture is, the central, central channel country is a whole a series of inland rivers that are frequently dry. Uh, but when Queensland floods, those channels will fill with water 
and the water will eventually end up in Lake Eyre in South Australia, where um, once the wa flood waters get into Lake Eyre, we'll have a massive breeding event of um, uh, all sorts of water birds. Uh, and they'll also um, breed in the channel country when, the, when it's flooding. Uh, this is non binny uh, nature reserve. Uh, it's mostly mallee, which is a type of eucalypt, um, which has, instead of if you're used to the, the very tall uh, eucalypts like the mountain ash forests, which are some of the tallest trees in the world, uh, mallees are basically fairly low to the ground and are multi-stemmed so that if the bushfire goes through and they get burnt, they can reshoot from those uh, multi-stems that are underneath, the, mostly underneath the ground. And one of the uh, ubiquitous birds in Australia is the emu. Um, it's here we have a male at the back right, and then all the others are young birds. So this, um, the females will lay the eggs, um, usually up to about 30 eggs. And the male then sits on the nest for two months, hatches the eggs, and then looks after the young for about 18 months until they're old enough to look after themselves. So these ones are probably about a year old. And uh, the emu is actually on the Australian coat of arms along with the kangaroo. And the, uh, the two animals were chosen because neither of them can actually go backwards. They can only go forwards. We have a number of very interesting uh, pigeons and doves in Australia. This is um, one of the most striking, I think, the common bronzewing. Um, it's found over much of um, Eastern Australia and also in Western Australia. And it's, uh, there's a group of um, bronze wings in Australia, the brush bronze wing and the um, flock bronze wing. And they named that because of the beautiful colors in the feathers, uh, which have a whole lot of iridescence. And if you get the light just right, which John managed to do, you can see the extent of that, those beautiful colors. The other interesting thing is as the light changes or you change your angle, those colors change. Uh, this is a male with the, um, the yellowish um, forehead and the female's a bit, um, mostly has a brownish head um, and a, a little less white around the face. Um, here are some of our honey eaters. Uh, we've got something like close to 80 species of honey eaters in Australia. Uh, this is the grey fronted honey eater, which is one of the, um, the dry, more of the dry country honey eaters. There's a whole uh, group of very similar looking honey eaters um, that are found uh, around Australia. So you, you'll basically get sort of greenish with flashes of yellow and white or um, purple in all sorts of places. Uh, and our honey eaters can be very small to quite large birds. Here's one of our robins. Um, I have to admit my, uh, I had an English birder out here um, a number of years ago. And I mentioned to him that my sister-in-law had been to England and had been disappointed in the robin there because it was brown. He said, oh no, it's not, it's red. And just at that moment, I could show him a red cap robin, a male, a scarlet robin, and a flame robin, all of whom are bright red. And he agreed that, yes, the English robins are actually brown, not red. Uh, this, is a, this is one of the dry country robins. Um, we've got some robins that uh, like uh, wet forests or rainforests, uh, but this is often found out in the drier areas. And they're quite a quite a small robin, but found quite extensively through these areas. Uh, this is the white winged triller. So this is um, closely related to the varied triller. So it's another of our cuckoo shrikes uh, and it will come all the way down into Southern Australia. It's, it's a smallish bird, often feeds on the ground. And our fairy wrens. This is one of the most spectacular, the splendid fairy wren. Uh, bright blue, as you can see, um, 
some people may be familiar with the superb fairy wren, which is found on in southeastern Australia, which doesn't have as extensive blue. It's uh, the, the belly and, and breast, lower breast is actually brown. But they're um, small birds. There's quite a few of them found all over Australia. And these ones tend, splendids tend to like the dry country as well. So you, you'll get them in um, from Northwestern Victoria um, up through the, the dry areas and, and across um, all the way into Western Australia. Now our babblers, as I said, they're not related at all to any of the overseas babblers. They're more closely related to all, all of our other uh, songbirds here. Uh, we've got four species of uh, babbler. This is the grey crown, which is the probably has the uh, most extensive um, territory. And I've uh, recently, late last year, I did a trip from Mount Isa in Queensland down to Adelaide, and we managed to get all four babbler species on that trip, as well as nine species of grass wren. Now our cockatoos don't only come in white, we also have a series of black cockatoos. Um, this is the red-tailed black cockatoo. Um, we've got um, yellow-tailed black cockatoos and we've got a couple of white-tailed black cockatoo species in Western Australia. Um, this has a number of subspecies that are found um, through the Channel Country up into um, Cape York and all the way over to Western Australia. And um, one of the times to see them is if you can find a, a nice big water hole or a river um, in the late afternoon, you can get um, large flocks coming in um, after they've been out feeding all day. Now the apostle bird is one of Australia's mud nesting birds. Um, it's related also to the white winged chuff which is not, as I said, related to the chuffs overseas. These two birds are fairly closely related. Um, they were originally uh, grouped with the magpie lark, which also builds a mud nest, but that's, as I said, been recently found to be a, one of the, an aberrant monarch flycatcher. Um, very interesting that it also builds a mud nest since none of the monarch flycatchers do. Uh, they're called apostle birds because they were thought to always be found in groups of 12, like the 12 apostles. They're very inquisitive. Um, they'll come right up to you or sit in the tree above you and, and murmur at you. We have a number of quail thrushes, um, all of whom like to stay undercover and um, view you from a distance. This one, um, is the chestnut breasted quail thrush. We've, uh, they recently split a few quail thrushes. So we ended up with a, with a couple more species. Um, they've got a very high whistle, um, very high pitched whistle, but it's also very soft. So you need fairly good um, hearing uh, to know that they're in the area, but they all like um, either dry country like this, or we've even got one on the Nullarbor plain, which where there's no trees at all, and they'll just uh, work, walk through all the, the low vegetation. We have a number of tree creepers, um, as I said, not related to the creepers overseas. Um, they're typically found in forested habitats, um, and they will work their way up a tree, circling the trunk uh, and looking for any insects under the bark. And we have a couple that are also um, frequently found on the ground. Uh, the brown tree creeper and the rufous tree creeper will alternate uh, from um, ground, looking through the ground cover uh, up into the trees. And here's the major Mitchell cockatoo. It's a spectacular pink and white cockatoo with a bright orange and yellow crest. Um, it's only found out in um, in the very dry country. We do get them into northwestern Victoria, um, where we've got the, some Mallee areas. Um, the numbers seem to have been um, reducing over the years. They're much harder to find. 
um, there's some suspicion that that it's not only due to land clearing but also poaching because they're such a beautiful cockatoo. Now up in the Channel Country, um, this is typical of the area of the swamps you'll find up there. We've got this um, plant called lignum, or this is tangled lignum, uh, and you'll get extensive areas uh, where you've got lignum. And this is where a lot of the birds breed, especially um, grass wren up there. You'll get um, all sorts of birds, plus a whole lot of ducks. So when, when the floods happen, all of the ducks that spend the um, the dry times out on the coast. So they use the wetlands on the coast as a refuge. Uh, and when it floods inland, they all head in to breed. And this is up in the, uh, the basin of the Cooper River. But it's one of the places where you'll get grey grass wren, which have a very restricted uh, range. This is the, unfortunately, the best photo I could actually find. Now the grass wrens tend to be, they're larger than fairy wrens and emu wrens, uh, but they're, they, and some of them can be quite large, um, but they're all, they all like to stay undercover and are difficult to find. Um, if you get a sustained look, you're incredibly lucky. Often it's just a fleeting look as they run between the vegetation. And they're very uh, fast when they're doing that as well. So. You'll be pointing out to people, it's, it's next to the third bush. And by the time you've said that, they're already at the fifth or sixth bush. Um, some of the areas are much more open, as you can see here. And these are the sort of places where you go looking for one of Australia's uh, rarest falcons, the grey falcon. Um, it's a bird hunting specialist, very fast. Um, but it's also surprisingly small. It's a, it's a little bit bigger than a galah, which is our pink and gray parrot, our cockatoo. And it's one of the, one of the species that um, is, a, is a big target for many birders. Now this is an area of Gibber Plain. So these are part of the, the stony deserts. Um, this one is in reasonable condition. Often when it's been exceedingly dry, uh, there's hardly any vegetation. And this, is, this has had a bit of rain, so there's been some vegetation come up. These are the sort of places where you'll find gibber birds, which is one of our five species of chats. Um, our chats are actually a type of honey eater. Um, it, it came as a bit of a shock to people when they did some DNA work on the honey eaters and the chats and they found out that these actually land right in the middle of our honey eaters. They mostly feed on the ground, um, or the, the, all five species of chats, and they're quite beautiful, beautiful colours. And this is found in the hottest areas. So. Um, these, these areas can get up to about 50 degrees Celsius in the, in the height of summer. Uh, we've also got Burke's parrot, which is this um, beautiful small parrot with um, pink and blue, soft pink and blue plumage. Uh, and that pink and blue is actually the same color as the sky, just on sunset as the, as the, the night starts to come in. And they're found out in these um, very dry areas, um, but they frequently come into water, especially in the, in the late afternoon when you can often see them then. Another bird you get out there is the inland dotterel. It's one of a, it's a shore bird that's actually found out in these very, very dry, hot conditions. Um, they're very difficult to see out there. Um, if you're, this one, luckily was turned sideways, uh, they tend to keep their back turned to you at all times. So as you move around, they will actually rotate to keep their back to you so that they hope they'll blend into the um, surroundings. And the budgerigar, this is the color of the um, wild bird. It's bright green and yellow. Um, the captive ones are often blue or yellow or white. 
And that's because the green, the, the natural color is yellow all over. Uh, and the green is due to a structure in the feather that reflects blue light and absorbs all the other parts of the spectrum so that it appears green where the blue structure is in the feathers. Now, if you mutate those, if you remove the blue structure, you end up with an entirely yellow bird. And if you remove the yellow, you end up with a blue bird. And if you remove both, you get a white bird, which is why they're the, the three colors that you get in captive budgerigars. And when, it's, uh, when they're breeding, you can see these birds in their thousands, just covering the trees and looking for nest hollows uh, and coming into water. So you'll, you'll see them land and, and drink the water and then they'll, uh, something like a goshawk will come through and they'll all take off and circle around, uh, all chattering away wildly. One of the other birds found over much of Australia, but uh, particularly up here is the Australian Owlet Nightjar. It's the only Owlet Nightjar we have in Australia. There's another species in Papua New Guinea. And they're usually during the day found in a nest hollow. Uh, this one flushed from a, um, a stump that had a deep hollow in the center uh, and then went up and landed on a, a branch and watched us for a while. They're quite a small bird. Um, and if you only see the head, you may mistake it for a possum. Uh, it has that soft um, plumage that looks more like fur over its head. But once you see it out of the hollow, it's, it's much more clearly defined. And this is part of the Gibber Plain and this has had a nice lot of water. So there's uh, a lots of plants that are flowering at the moment. And if you look about middle of the picture, slightly below middle and slightly to the right, if you've got very good eyesight, you might see something that looks a bit, a black and white spot in there. And that's a male flock bronze wing. Um, this is another of the birds that people go looking for. Uh, they move vast distances, um, often in large flocks. But they, they're very nomadic. They turn up um, in that area. You, you may be up there for weeks and never see any. Um, but occasionally, you might see some big flocks. And on this particular trip, we were very lucky to come across a few. Uh, we ended up seeing probably about 50 all up. But um, when conditions are really good, um, there's, you can get quite large numbers, especially coming into water. Um, since they feed on uh, seeds out in the dry ground, and then they'll come into water in the afternoon and, and sometimes in the morning. Here's another of our chats, the orange chat. You can, as you can see, they're, they're quite um, beautifully colored, these birds. And this is a, this is a male orange chat. Now, in the Strzelecki Desert, we have a series of um, sand dunes, uh, these re bright red sand dunes with um, uh, sort of what we call swales in between. Um, this, as you can see, was in a particularly good time. There'd been plenty of rain, so lots of wildflowers were out. Um, and this is the sort of place where you go looking for Aryan grass wren. So they're, they're up on the, the tops of those sand dunes. And you need to know exactly which sand dune to go looking for. They can be difficult. Now, we finally get to the picture that was on the front cover. This is a crimson chat. This is a male crimson chat beautifully positioned up there. So as I said, this is one of our small honey eaters. Um, quite surprising. They, they look just like the, the chats overseas and they um, spend their time on the ground, but they're a type of honey eater. Um, banded whiteface, there are three species of whiteface in Australia. Um, two of them are mostly found in the deserts and uh, one is found mostly on the coast, but uh, occasionally inland. Um, and this is the banded white face. It's not the rarest of them, but 
um, around Bollard's Lagoon, Strzelecki Desert is a good place to find them. We also have some pardalotes, which are small, um, small birds that mostly feed on um, what are called lerps. So they like eucalypt trees where we have a little insect called a psyllid that extracts the sap from the, um, the leaves and builds a sugary dome over itself. And the pardalotes particularly like eating that sugary uh, secretion. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the larger honey eaters will chase them away so they can uh, reserve the, the food for themselves. And they've even been known to kill the pardalotes. So the pardalotes usually fly very high and very fast uh, away. And this is the red-browed pardalote, which is the one found in inland Australia um, in, the, in the dry areas. Now, one of our um, very interesting raptors, the black-breasted buzzard, it's not related to the buzzards overseas. It's one of the um, original raptors in Australia. There's some really unusual birds here. Um, it's um, kept, mostly kept into the inland um, and there's, they're getting harder and harder to find. There's less and less of them, but those big black, um, the, the, the black wing tips and the white bullseyes give it away each time. One of the other interesting raptors is the letter wing kite. This is actually a nocturnal um, bird of prey. Um, it hunts mostly um, um, long haired rats, which are entirely nocturnal. So it's got this bird has very large eyes set in um, black sooty areas to help it um, see the, the, the rats at night. And they've got very soft plumage, very similar to an owl's. Uh, they're only found in places like the Central Channel Country and uh, the deserts where they will nest communally. Um, so there'll be several nests uh, in some eucalypts along a creek line. And when the, uh, the numbers will increase when the long haired rats are breeding, um, and then the birds will then move, often move towards the coast when the, there's no long haired rats to be fed on. Um, this is some of the other sort of country you'll get out here. So we're sort of getting to the end of the Strzelecki, Southern Strzelecki track, um, sort of shale, which can be very difficult to walk on but it's where you'll find Rufus field wrens. So this is another of our wren types, simply because it has a cocked tail. And it's also where you find the chestnut breasted white face, our rarest white face. Uh, these are closely related to scrub wrens, the white faces. The Western grass wren is found down here as well. Um, this is down near Wyala. And one of the birds that um, many, many overseas birders come to Australia to see is the plains wanderer. It's the only species in the family Pedionomidae. Uh, it's a strange shorebird, most closely related to the seed snipes of South America. Uh, but it, it likes um, very short grass, sparse grass, and is found in the, the Southern Channel country and down into Northwestern Victoria. In fact, around um, uh, Terek Terek in Northwestern Victoria and just over the border into Daniloquin in New South Wales are the two main places where uh, people go looking for them. Um, and the best time to see them is to go spotlighting at night because they'll actually stand still then during the day they'll run away. Now, once you've birded in Australia, on the mainland of Australia, there's more. There's Australia's external territories. Uh, this shows, um, if you look to the uh, Northwest Australia, you can see Cocos and Christmas Island and Ashmore Reef. You've got the Northern Torres Strait Islands. So all the islands in Torres Strait actually belong to Australia. They were, they were um, when Papua New Guinea was separated um, from Australia, the, um, they were given the option and they all decided to stay with Australia. Uh, out to the east, you've got Lord Howe and Norfolk Island. Uh, Macquarie Island is 
basically in the south of uh, New Zealand and heard of McDonald Islands out to the in the Southern Ocean out to the west, which contain Australia's two active volcanoes. Uh, and we've also got um, the Australian Antarctic Territory, but it's not marked on this particular map. And the reason people go to places such as Cocos Christmas and the Northern Torres Strait and Ashmore Reef is um, to, uh, in search of, as well as the birds that are naturally found there, uh, there's also a whole range of endemics that can turn up, oh, sorry, a whole range of vagrants that can turn up. Um, so we've got Asian migrants that migrate away from the breeding area down into Indonesia and quite a few overshoot and end up on Cocos and Christmas Island. And I was there in last December, uh, I think it was about my 15th trip there and I still got three new species. So it's, they're great places to go. And if you're looking for a field guide, this is the, the best field guide. We call it ABG, the Australian Bird Guide. Um, it was first published in 2017 after 15 years of development by some of Australia's best birders and researchers. Um, the revised edition came out in 2019. Uh, has a better um, index at the back. Um, and the compact bird guide only came out last year. It's got a much up, more up-to-date taxonomy, but it does exclude the external territories and um, a few vagrants. Uh, the large guide is about 1400 grams. This compact guide is about 400, but um, so the large one is a bit difficult to carry around, but it's a good one to have in your car for a reference because it's got excellent information. And that's the end. Thanks, Tanya, that was really great. I think everyone enjoyed that very much. Um, we've got some questions here. If, um, let me just get to them. Um, Elizabeth asks, what makes Australia's birds of paradise so unusual? Well, there's, there's actually about, I think all up, there's about 46 birds of paradise, most in um, uh, New Guinea. Uh, we've got four. We've got the, the three rifle birds and the trumpet manucode. Um, we don't have all the, the really spectacular ones. We've got the sort of the smaller ones that are mostly black. Um, they're only found in fairly much the remnant rainforest that you get along um, the Queensland coast. Um, so some of them will be down into the subtropical rainforest around um, the New South Wales Queensland border. Um, but the, the two that are found in Papua New Guinea are only up the sort of the very top of Cape York and Iron Range. Okay, but it's, it's, it's just really interesting that we've still got some birds of paradise in Australia, considering the, the um, how little rainforest we really have. Oh, that's interesting, thanks. Leone asks, what are the threats, if any, on indigenous bird species by alien and invasive species, such as wild pigs, rats, or mice? Oh, goodness. Probably the largest threat um, is climate change. Um, you may have uh, heard that we had massive bushfires along the east coast of Australia in 2019, 2020. Um, they, they think that over a billion birds um, were killed in those bushfires. They were so extensive and so hot. Um, and it's entirely due to um, climate change that these things are happening. Uh, you've also got um, land clearing. Um, even though we try to uh, prevent that, there are some states that are still promoting the clearing of, of um, treed areas. Um, whereas other areas are, are busy trying to re-vegetate re as much as they can. Um, you've got threats from um, not only wild pigs, you've got, we've got foxes, we've got feral cats um, that are a massive problem. Uh, we've got, I mean, there's something like 
I think there's, they estimate something like 5 million feral cats in Australia, and they're um, particularly bad in the outback uh, in central Australia. Um, they, can, they can travel quite extensively. Um, there's some people who've been doing some recent tracking studies on cats, and they'll f they find that if you get a, um, a bushfire, cats will travel up to 100 kilometres to hunt on the edges of those burn scars because that's where the vegetation's been cleared and the animals are much more um, e easily caught. Wow, that's quite shocking. Um, Andrew's question, I think you've probably answered. Um, can you comment regarding the 2019-2020 fires and were birds as impacted as the terrestrial and arboreal species? Yeah, the, the fires were so large and so fast uh, and so hot that they, as I said, they estimate about a billion birds were killed in those fires. Um, there's a number of species where, um, especially species that with very small ranges, um, where people dashed in ahead of the fires to um, catch some of the birds and take them into captivity to, to make sure they weren't wiped out. Wow, that is really shocking. Wow. You know, it's actually mind-boggling what actually happened there. Um, okay, Leonie asks, will it be possible to distribute a copy of this presentation to us? Um, Leonie, it will be on, on our Learn the Birds YouTube channel. So um, we will send you the link um, once it is posted there. Um, I see Derek did answer that. Are there any more questions? Um, David asks, such a beautiful collection of colourful birds, most impressive. Is Tasmania part of Australia and are there any species only found there in Tasmania? Uh, yes, it's definitely part of Australia. Um, in fact, uh, as well as flying to it, there's a ferry uh, that you can take um, from um, Victoria to um, Tasmania, which takes about 10 or 11 hours and often will either do a day trip or an overnight trip. Uh, and you can take your uh, vehicle on it. So, um, and in, in fact, it's the vehicle uh, is subsidized by the federal government because it's considered a national highway. Um, and there's, 12 species that are only found in Tasmania. So oh. it's a, a good a good birding destination. Yeah, it's interesting. And Leonie says she's been planning a trip there for years. So um, she's hoping it will come true <laughs> next year or the year after. Yeah. Oh, well, to study, study up on the parrots and the honey eaters. We've got some spectacular uh, birds in both. Yeah, and a lot of people saying they've really enjoyed your presentation this evening. Well, thank you. Yeah, are there any more questions before I wrap up? Not a, not a question, but maybe Lynette make, a, make mention of the webinar that's uh, next week as well, because we have two, two webinars yeah. this month. Yes, um, next week, Thursday at the normal eight o'clock time, um, seven o'clock time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, seven o'clock till eight o'clock. Um, uh, Krista Oswald, um, who has presented here before on the Cape Rock Jumper, she will be talking about Arabian babblers. She's currently doing a study on them in Israel. So, and she's a brilliant speaker as well. So, please, um, we'll see you next week seven o'clock. Are there any more questions before I wrap up? I see the and I'll put in a plug for the for the one after that, which is on the 13th of April, which is an interesting uh, talk on light pollution in the night sky and how it affects uh, seabirds. And it's going to be given by uh, uh, Bill Montevecchi, Professor Bill Montevecchi, uh, um, a professor at Memorial University that I knew when I was a student. So he's a fair bit older than me. So he's got lots and lots and lots of seabird experience.
But that sounds good. Yes, I'll definitely be attending that. Um, Tanya, thanks so much. We really, really enjoyed that. I've learned so much about Aussie birds. Um, and, and I didn't even look at ducks or seabirds. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's so many birds we've missed out. Yeah, well, next time, there's always a next time. We'd love to have you back to come and chat about more Aussie birds. Okay, no worries. No, definitely. Yeah. Okay, can we wrap up now? Um, I don't think there are any more questions. Oh, thanks very much. Bye, I'll see you all next week. Seems like I was talking muted. I was saying uh, thanks very much for a really great presentation, Tanya. Uh, really enjoyed it. I'm glad you liked it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.